Nurse. Isn't this our DWI patient? I ordered two units of blood, a CAT scan, and booking the OR for emergency surgery. The man has internal bleeding, so there's no time to lose. What's he still doing here? It looks like you've done nothing. He's not even hooked up to oxygen. What? He's a Jew? No, not a Jew, a JW, a Jehovah's Witness. They're the ones who won't take blood. So, Dr. Henderson said it was pointless to do anything else, because without blood, he'll be dead in a few minutes no matter what we do. The man came in unconscious. How do you know he's a JW? He had one of these. I recognize it from other patients I've seen. And our chaplain, Pastor Russ, has seen the patient on the internet. Yes, it's Anthony Morris III. He's one of their leaders, the governing body they call themselves. He's a real stickler on their prohibition on blood. Well, page Dr. Charles and ask him to declare the man incompetent to make his own medical decisions. Then give him the blood, stat. No! You can't do that! That's a violation of the laws of God and man. Excuse me, but who are you? A family member? I'm Fred Krantz of the HLC, the Hospital Liaison Committee. I'm here to ensure this man's wishes are honored and his rights are respected. And to explain to you what blood fractions he can and cannot accept in order to maintain his integrity to Jehovah, our God. A lawyer? No. Has the patient legally given you power of attorney? Well, no. Then you have no business being here. Get out of here before I call security. This man's life is in danger, and you're wasting our time. No. Brother Morris would want me here, defending his religious freedom. It's all a mistake, though. You know, your ban on blood. It's not against God's law to accept blood. Oh. I'd expect as much from a clergyman. Have you never read Acts chapter 15? For the Holy Spirit and we ourselves have favored adding no further burden to you except these necessary things, to keep abstaining from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you carefully keep yourselves from these things, you will prosper. Good health to you. Injecting blood into your veins is not abstaining from blood. Yes. I have read that. Have you ever read Leviticus 19 verse 19? You should keep my statutes. You must not interbreed two sorts of your domestic animals. You must not sow your field with two sorts of seed, and you must not wear a garment made with two sorts of thread mixed together. Care to show us the label on your suit? I'll bet it violates that last biblical rule. It's a wool and silk blend. So, what? That's from the Mosaic Law. That law passed away with Jesus' sacrifice. It's not binding on Christians today. Oh, so you're saying that we must consider the context of a scripture, and not just yank it out and follow it as if it necessarily applies to us today? Of course. So then, maybe if we considered the context of abstain from blood, it would reveal the fact that it too is not something binding on Christians today. In the first place, this is not a commandment from God or Jesus. It is the words of someone named James. Who is this James, and why should we assume that he had any business encumbering Christians with such rules? When Jesus was asked what the commandments were, did he mention any of these dietary restrictions? No, he did not. He stated two commandments to rule all behavior, to love God and to love your neighbor. So, why would James, as a follower of Christ, take it upon himself to add extra commandments. The fact is, he wouldn't, no real Christian would. So, what was going on here? Well, the first verse of that chapter in the book of Acts gives us the answer. It tells us that certain men, known as Judaizers, were insisting that Gentile Christians needed to get circumcised. The meeting, related in Acts 15, was called to decide the matter. James disagreed with the need for circumcision, but in order to appease the Judaizers, 
decided to caution Gentile Christians against violating the more publicly obvious of the Jewish customs, such as engaging in lewd behavior, eating meat sacrificed to idols, or eating meat that had not been properly bled. The Bible clearly states that this was the reason for the decision, not that it was a commandment from God that involved a Christian salvation, but rather because, according to verse 21, From ancient times Moses has had those who preach him in city after city, because he is read aloud in the synagogues on every Sabbath. The advice was that these practices be abstained from, because Jews certainly would consider the eating of such meats as participating in heathen idolatry. Christian freedom did not obligate one to follow the dietary laws of the Jews. Paul makes this crystal clear in 1 Corinthians, chapters 8 and 10, where he writes that he, as a Christian, is perfectly free to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Nevertheless, it was advisable that the Gentile Christians abstain from the use of their liberty in this matter, out of deference to the weaker brethren, Jews and Gentiles, who could not so deeply philosophize and whose consciences might be injured. A similar thought attaches to the prohibition of the use of blood. To the Jew it was forbidden, and under his covenant it was made a symbol of life, to partake of it would imply responsibility for the life taken. These prohibitions had never come to the Gentiles, because they had never been under the law covenant, but so deeply rooted were the Jewish ideas on this subject that it was necessary to the peace of the church that the Gentiles should observe this matter also. If they did not wish to be contentious and cause divisions in the church, the Gentile brethren would surely be willing to restrain or sacrifice their liberty respecting these matters. However, today there are no Jews or Christians, outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who would be stumbled by a Christian having a blood transfusion. So, the rationale behind the request that James made no longer exists. Therefore, Christians are free to have blood transfusions. Well, that's certainly a pretty speech. But it's wrong. Gentiles were prohibited from blood, even though they were never under the Mosaic law. Being descendants of Noah, they came under the everlasting covenant made with Noah after the flood. Didn't you make it past chapter 4 of Genesis in your seminary? There we read God's command. Only flesh with its life, its blood, you must not eat. I can comment on that. In Hebrew school we were taught from the Talmud that this means that we are not to eat flesh from a living being, not to bite into an animal that is alive, with its life still in it. Interesting, I hadn't considered that before, yet that's literally what the verse says. It's a prohibition against eating a certain type of flesh, living flesh. It's not a prohibition against blood at all. Oh, that's just hair-splitting semantics. It's obvious that God wants us all to abstain from blood. Well, there's another verse in the Bible that contradicts your idea that Gentiles were forbidden to eat blood. In Deuteronomy 14 verse 21 we read, You must not eat any animal that was found dead. You may give it to the foreign resident who is inside your cities, and he may eat it, or it may be sold to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to Jehovah your God. An animal found dead would not have been properly bled. That's why a Jew could not eat it, being part of a holy people, under a covenant with God, but the verse tells us that a non-Jew could eat it, blood and all. Surely you haven't been sacrificing people's lives on the basis of such flimsy misinterpretations of scripture. Have you? No, there's more to it than that. We see a consistent pattern throughout the Bible of God condemning the eating of blood. Leviticus 17 verse 14 is another clear instance. Leviticus? Isn't that part of the Mosaic law? You know it is. But you already said, when I mentioned that your apparel violates that law, that Christians are no longer under that law. Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand you? You didn't misunderstand. But I'm not using Leviticus here as a law, but as a principle. God hates the use of blood. Yet he created vampire bats, mosquitoes, and a host of other creatures who cannot survive without eating blood. He allowed Gentiles to eat unbled animals, and he allowed Paul, under inspiration, to state that a Christian could eat anything sold in the market without being concerned that they might be eating meat sacrificed to idols or meat from an unbled animal. Why would that be, if he hated it so much? Well, I don't claim to know everything. All I know is that if we try to save our life by violating God's laws, then we'll lose our everlasting life. That's a deeply held religious conviction that I'm sure even you gentlemen can appreciate. 
No! I can't appreciate it at all. In Hebrew school, we learned the rabbinic principle known as Pikwach Nefesh. Saving life supersedes God's law. That's wonderful. But we're Christians, not Jews. Oh, but Jesus lived by this principle as well. It's taught to us in Matthew chapter 12. At that season, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples got hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. At seeing this, the Pharisees said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what it is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and the men with him got hungry? How he entered into the house of God and they ate the loaves of presentation, food it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests only. Jesus didn't believe that one should starve to death before breaking a commandment. His actions and teachings show that he believed that God's commandments could be broken in life or death situations. As he said, the law was made for man, and not man for the law. It was meant to be a help in living a good life, not a cause for death. Your own Watchtower magazine reached the same conclusion when commenting on these verses, stating that Jesus was calling attention to acts of mercy on the Sabbath day, that it was perfectly legitimate to render a show of mercy to one who is in need even though it was the Sabbath, and that there is, in effect, no violation of the Sabbath by such course of action. So, even if you still mistakenly think that accepting blood violates God's law, then this principle should show you that when it comes to saving a life, there is no violation. Name? Anthony Morris III. Don't you recognize me? I'm a member of the governing body. Governing? What? Body? You must be joking. The Jehovah's Witnesses, of course. The Jehovah's? What? Oh, never mind. Here you are. No, this isn't right. You're not supposed to be here for a few years yet. What happened? Evidently, I was in a car accident. I think, I think I drove into a tree or something. I see. It seems you may have had a bit too much to drink, the record isn't clear on that. But, according to this, you were supposed to survive that incident. Well, I probably would have, if I had violated my faith and accepted a blood transfusion. Okay. Head that way. All early arrivals have to see the boss. Hi there, Jesus. It's Anthony. I'm ready to be in heaven. Just give me a horse and a sword and we can get this Armageddon thing going. Can't wait to smell those human hot dogs Ossislin. Tony, my son, I'm afraid we can't let you in. You've got blood on your hands. What? Whose blood? I tell you I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Do you remember Joshua Walker? Oh sure, that little fella. He stuck to his guns, just like me, and refused blood. I paid tribute to his faith at a convention in 2016. And he died long before his time. We had big plans for him. What about Dennis Lindbergh? I don't remember him. He was a 14-year-old who died refusing blood back in 2007. I could give you thousands of such names, but you probably wouldn't even recognize them. We just told people about God's law concerning blood. The rest was their personal decision. Children aren't capable of making such life and death decisions based on your convoluted reasoning. You and your cohorts are blood guilty. You used your undue influence to coerce children, and their parents, into giving up their lives. Well, should we have told them to disobey God's law? Saving their lives just to lose their everlasting lives? Don't you remember my telling the Pharisees, I want mercy? and not sacrifice. You were just like them, always making more rules about ever smaller minutiae. But missing the spirit of things. 
Imagine issuing edicts about what fractions of blood are acceptable. When did I ever mention blood fractions? Where is it in any page of your enormous Bible? I said that my load was kindly in light. I taught about forgiveness and love. I said the entire law could be summed up by love. There is nothing loving in forcing a parent to withhold life-saving medical care from their child. Love trumps laws, even what you imagine to be God's laws. But you didn't understand that. You presumed to tell your followers that God wanted sacrifice, not mercy. I said that nothing that enters a person can defile him. Didn't you realize that this includes blood? Only what comes out of a person can defile him. Words, words that lead to death, such as the words in the watchtower demanding the sacrifice of children's lives on your altar of blood. These words have defiled you, and made you unfit to be in my sight any longer. Wait! I demand to see your supervisor. Take me to Jehovah to plead my case. Who? Oh, yeah, you're that group that still believes in the war god of the ancient Israelites and Canaanites. You were a Jew, you also believed in Jehovah, didn't you? No. Why do you think I never mentioned him? Yahweh was a cruel, angry, vengeful god, whom I wanted nothing to do with. I tried to turn men's thoughts to a loving, heavenly father figure, whom they could emulate. You, emulated, Jehovah, no wonder you're eager to fight a war. Oh, jeez. What? Sorry. I mean, well, what happens now? To me? Well, there's one thing you guys got right. Death is the absence of life, and nothing survives it. In a moment you will cease to exist. Brother Morris! Morris! Will someone nudge him awake? What? We're voting, brother. Everyone else has their hand up already. Oh. Remind me, what is it we're voting on? To approve this letter to the HLC elders, reaffirming our stance on the importance of preventing blood transfusions in babies, the group most commonly in need of them. Wait a minute. I had a dream. Wow. All about the blood doctrine. Was it a revelation? Ah, uh, no. It wasn't anything I didn't know already. Besides, we don't believe Jehovah communicates to us anymore in dreams. I'll make it unanimous. I vote yes.